गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी एंड अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर आशुतोष दत्ता वी वेलकम यू टू दिस वर्चुअल प्लेटफॉर्म ऑफ दिस फाइव डेज कोर्स ऑन फ्यूचरिस्टिक वेलनेस कम्युनिकेशन एंड आई ओ टी फाइव जी एंड बी ऑन कंडक्टेड फ्रॉम सेवन टू इलेवेंथ नवम्बर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी ऑर्गेनाइज ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिकल इंजीनियरिंग National Institute of Technology Rorkela It's my pleasure now to introduce our distinguished lecture uh, uh, IEEE Kamsak uh, distinguished speaker Professor Asutosh Datta to deliver his talk on security in SDN NFP and 5G networks opportunities and challenges We are thankful to him for accepting our invitation. Professor Asutas Datta is currently senior scientist and 5G chief strategist at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He is also a John Hopkins University Applied Physics uh, Laboratory sabbatical fellow and adjunct faculty at the John Hopkins University Asutosh also serves as the chair for electrical and computer engineering department of engineering for professional program at John Hopkins University His career spanning more than 30 years includes director of technology security and lead member of technical staff at AT&T CTO of Wireless for Nixon Inc senior central senior scientist and project manager at Telcordia Research director of central research facility at Columbia University adjunct faculty okay uh I wanted to make sure you can see my slide. Yeah, it is visible. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I just <laughs> because sometimes you just don't know what happens, right? Anyway, so my uh, today's uh, talk is uh, security as DNA IP and 5G networks. Um, I will focus uh, just to make sure some people um, there are many students also in the audience. So uh, SDN stands for Software Defined Networking. and uh, nap stands for network function virtualization and we consider uh, this to be the foundation uh, for 5g networks that is evolving uh, so before my job at john hopkins i used to work for at&t where uh, is one of the largest operators in the world uh, and like any other operator everybody is trying to evolve to 5g right so they all have to set the uh, network foundation to make it programmable and flexible uh, before they can start building the other Five gen apples, right? So with that, uh, this is kind of my talk outline. Um, I'll set the stage a little bit uh, because this is a course, so I want to make sure um, we give some historic background of the wireless evolution, uh, then how five G is different uh, from the previous generation like four G and three G, uh, then I deep dive into security taxonomy uh, and focusing on uh, mostly in SD and NAB. I consider that as a pillar for five G. and then uh, you know go into other pillars and i illustrate some use cases codes. so i uh, want to make and sure. with that i'll talk about securities opportunities and challenges so whenever uh, we transition to a new generation of network uh, we get a lot of benefits uh, at the same time uh, because we are adding a lot of enablers new components we have to also think about some challenges that come with it and that means we have to take care of that then i will say a little bit about what's going on in different standards and there are many test beds being built around the world uh, including you know ieee taking uh, some initiative there and how can you get involved in some of those test beds because uh, you know you can build your own test bed in your own lab or you can even communicate you know continue to collaborate with other test beds around the world and get connected and run your experiments right so that is a good part of it a lot of virtual test beds if time permits i'll say a little bit about the uh, future networks initiative where i'm deeply involved one of the co-chairs and got about 300 to 350 uh, volunteers around the world and how they're 
contributing uh, to the future evolution of the roadmap, uh, you know, in education, uh, technology, standards, conferences, and various activities, how you can get involved. So with that, uh, my next slide, uh, as engineers uh, or technologists, or whatever, right, because everybody is contributing to this world, uh, we need to think uh, why we need a new network, why you need an SDN and NFV, or why do you need even 5G or 6G. Um, so it's always motivated by the type of application that um, uh, we'll be supporting, right? Uh, so if you, you know, go back to 30, 40 years from now, uh, people used to send email, you know, a few bits per second. Uh, you know, I even remember when I used to work for Tata Motors, it used to be called Telco, Tata Engineering Locomotive in Jamshedpur. And uh, we are sending like uh, connecting modem from uh, Jamshedpur to Pune. And uh, we're just so excited if you can send one <laughs> letter and goes to the other side. Uh, it was really interesting to see that, and that was back in 1985. Um, things have evolved over the years, right? Uh, and some of them need high bandwidth, some need low latency, some some need you know massive sensing, um, etc. Right? So in that uh, that case, uh, we have to make sure our network can support that. Um, our network can support uh, a sudden surge in traffic. It can support. Uh, bursty traffic, you know, sensing uh, small bytes of traffic. Uh, at the same time, it can be programmable, right? So if you see this kind of application, then you have to upgrade your whole network and take it to a new um, paradigm, right? So that's why you make it programmable. Um, and that's kind of driving the innovation of the new network, new technology, etc., right? And this is a slide, um, uh, uh, I was showing it yesterday also during the inaugural talk, um, how is going to help um, our community, our uh, humanity and large, right? Uh, so if you see here, what, with the introduction of 5G and beyond, uh, it's going to be all pervasive. You know, it can help in, with our intelligent transportation system, robotics at home, uh, smart grids. You know, I've just named a few things. So eventually, depending on the type of application that I showed, that can be mapped to different domains in our life, right? So that's how it's going to work out. Uh, so there is a there is a perfect linkage between your type of application they are supporting, your key performance indicators, uh, because you have to map it to how much bandwidth I need, what is the latency uh, I have to uh, abide by, uh, can I support bursty traffic or not, can I make the network programmable if there is a surge in traffic and I support that. Uh, so once you know that, then you try to map it to which domain, it could be agriculture, it could be education, could be public safety, right? Um, could be a uh, fast responder type network. Um, you know, all different domains. So it is. Uh, so that's the that's the key difference of 5G applicability is becoming multi-domain. It is just not making a call or sending uh, streaming traffic, right? It's much much more than that. So that kind of sets the motivation what we are doing. Now a little bit of history, and some of you. Uh, probably already know that, and students who are catching up, what's going on with cellular, right? So this is how the um, uh, you know, cellular industry started, and there is a Wi-Fi, which is IEEE um, doing, 802.11. I'll talk about that briefly. But if you look at the history, it started in 1980, everything was analog, and um, there are different countries, have different standards, like um, so in America, you know, tax, JTAX, Japan, Europe, and NMT, right? So these are all different analog uh, frequency modulation and things like that, right? Then 1990, when the digital uh, technology started uh, evolving, um, there are two camps, uh, 3GPP2, which was uh, driven mostly by Qualcomm, uh, and you see the different type of access technology, TDMA, CDMA. And then on the top, you had GSM, mostly driven by 3GPP, uh, with GPRS and Edge, et cetera, right? And if you look at it, the comment I was making before, uh, you know, Two kilobits per second, right? And then uh, fast forward, it became 2.5G, uh, where this became IS95, CDMA 2000. And around 2000, uh, uh, 3G started arriving, and the GSM people are still going on with WCDMA, and here it's CDMA 2000. Around 2008, I, I was very much involved in 3G PP2. I was at Telcodia Research at that point. And then uh, People, uh, WCDMA was taking its own path to enhance HSPA, and CDMA 2000 was supposed to go to the next one, ultra mobile broadband. 
uh, mostly led by Qualcomm. And there are many operators like Verizon, you know, they were still kind of using that Sprint, etc. cetera. Uh, even in India also, IDEA, I think they were still using that. Um, there are a few companies. And then uh, people thought they should all join force and they all moved to 3GPP. 3GPP2 was closed. That was the standardization body and the long-term evolution started, right? So if you see that this is the 4G, at the same time, uh, there's a WiMAX, a 16 that was going on um, in IEEE uh, as a you know wide area networking technology, right? Eh? Uh, and then uh, obviously since then many places in the world LTE is uh, already deployed. There are still 3G out there, and then people started working on um, 5G, right? And so 2020 we are now 2020, right? Things are still being developed, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, just because this is a course, I wanted to uh, give a little bit of uh, you know the channel spacing access type just just for your FYI. Uh, you know each of these, and you can look up to any book, and uh, I, I'll share the slides as well. But just to see how things have changed uh, with different channel spacing and access type, right? And how what is going on with, with 5G? Uh, we'll we'll take a look at that, right? Just just as a and if you see traditionally, obviously this was analog, then um, your uh, bit rate or bandwidth is actually going up and up, right? Now, with 5G is kind of gigabit. Um, so I, I talked about cellular, right? Which is uh, GSM, GPRS, 3G, LTE. Uh, and this is a slide, uh, my, my co-chair, uh, Gerard Petweiss from 5G Lab. Uh, he's, he's an authority in 5G. And so I borrowed this slide from him and he, this is a projection of how you see the Wi-Fi 802.11b, started 11.11b, that's uh, moving up at the same time, um, this is cellular, which is um, going in parallel. So if, if you go to Starbucks or Panera Bread or you know, any kind of hotspots, you are using 802.11 technology and then go out and get your car or train, then you, you might be using the cellular, right? So there is a coexistence. The, the point I'm making here is uh, they will continue to coexist, right? And so if you are doing any research, uh, any kind of experimental work, um, don't neglect the Wi-Fi part also, because that is it's getting a lot of momentum at, at the same time. So these two uh, technologies continue to complement, coexist, right? So that, that's important to uh, make sure. But so today, but I'll focus mostly on a cellular part, right? Uh, so with this, so what is 5G, right? And why, um, how it actually happened? So what happened is the ITU, the in uh, the International you know, Telecom Union, which is a international standards body. Right? Every country has their own people there. And they come up with new requirement. Uh, you know, it used to be IMT uh, 2000, IMT 2010, uh, IMT 2020. And if you see here, this IQ recommendation 2083 IMT vision, right? So they set up the KPIs requirements that I was talking about, right? You have enhanced mobile broadband, ultra low latency application, massive machine to machine type communication, right? So each of these have the KPIs, the key performance indicators where the peak data rate, what is the user experience data, uh, spectrum efficiency, uh, high mobility, uh, what is the latency, connection density. So these are the things which kind of define your use case. And one of the later slide, I'll explain how your deployment uh, is dependent on that, right? With the indoor, outdoor, uh, high uh, uh, velocity vehicle, things like that. So once they come up with this, they pass it on to 3GPP, which you I talked about before, you know, they have been progressing. And there, they come up with this technical requirement and specification. So 3GPP, you have, uh, many of you might have been uh, looking at. So that is a, uh, there are three different groups, uh, system architectural SA, there's a RAN radio access network, and there is a CT, the connectivity and terminal stuff, right? So they actually define the whole architecture, taking into account the services that need to be provided and mapping to a different KPIs, right? And then what I'm showing here is, uh, depending on the type of application, uh, you may need high bandwidth. Some application, you may not need high bandwidth, you may need just no low latency. Some of them like uh, smart city, you know, IoT, mass machine to machine type communication, you need, uh, you know, mass in machine type communication. And they're going in a phase wise, phase one, phase two, et cetera, right? So this is uh, how they're defining. And finally, once the, um, once the specification is out, it is standardized, then it's up to the vendors like Nokia, Siemens, uh, you know, Nokia, Ericsson, you know, they, 
develop the product and the operators they work with them and deploy it right um, and it has to happen in transition in transition stepwise so that's the process right this is another example uh, to make it a little clear that i was telling the previous generation of uh, 3g 4g they have been mostly ramping up bandwidth and uh, here we're adding additional uh, dimension like latency uh, your system control uh, passive uh, you know programmability uh, flexibility etc right so depending on the type of application if you see your virtual reality uh, you need high bandwidth or low latency on the other hand if you see on industrial automation you need low latency may not need that much of bandwidth so so now as a designer or architect of a network or if you are working in an operator world uh, you pick your uh, customers what they need what kind of application you want to provide and then depending on that you design your network and apply the right type of 5g enablers right so that's how, how you got to move so application is always driven by this kpis and requirement so how this is happening in 3G PP then, right? Um, so primarily now we know the enhanced mobile broadband, machine, machine, machine to machine type communication, ultra low latency, right? So these are the three main category of um, application. And when 3G PP is defining its uh, specification, uh, you know, initially let's say they focused on enhanced mobile broadband, this is the, the radio access part. And once that is it's already standardized, so they started using that to provide access to you know fixed wireless access 5g hotspots and depending on uh, the availability of a specific issue right uh, things start getting deployed right and you can see some of the uh, use cases that fall into these categories the one on the bottom what i was showing these are the enablers okay uh, so if you want to make your network flexible and programmable, right? You have NAB, SDN. Um, if you want to make your RAN programmable, you have Cloud RAN. You want to support ultra low latency application, you have um, edge computing. Uh, you want to make your network more uh, automated, you need orchestration, analytics, etc. Uh, you want to provide uh, different types of priority applications. So you, you have network slicing. So these are different enablers that you need uh, to be able to support different types of application now so when does security come in here so when uh, obviously these are added benefits then we look into the security aspects of each of these enablers by adding them what are the implication we are having right so i'll go through some use cases to make that clear so so far uh, we are kind of building the case uh, we started with why we need a new network and uh, you know a little bit of history uh, how 5g is actually different than previous generation right and how things get actually standardized uh, and different use cases and roadmap. Let's look at a little bit deep into the characteristics. So when you when you say 5G or any kind of cellular, right? You have a cell phone, you uh, connect to the network, you call somebody or download something, you know, send streaming or different types of application, right? So obviously there are several components end to end. So you have a uh, handset, you have a access tower, then uh, you have a core network, which you know many of us do not know. That plays the biggest part. So we always see only the radio access part. But you have a edge cloud. You have um, you know uh, a core network. I talk about later on, and then finally go to an application if you are supporting voice over IP. You know, in, in 4G network they call they call voice over LTE. So there are, there is an end-to-end -end ecosystem that is involved, and we'll see how 5G is changing that. So starting from the RAN side. Um, they call it 3GPP 5G new radio. Uh, you know, it, obviously it has a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, supporting variety of uh, frequency range, a millimeter wave, uh, a low band, mid band, high band, um, and sub, even sub six gigahertz. Massive MIMO that will give you the uh, beam steering uh, type uh, application. They can have lots of lots of bandwidth, and then because of uh, depending on which frequency you're using, if you're using high frequency, you get high bandwidth. But you have uh, densification of cells, right? So you have small cells. So you have lots of lots of cells. Uh, typically, uh, the backhaul uh, has been mostly fiber, right? When you have radio access network connect to the core network, uh, you have a backhaul uh, from the cell tower, right, to the, the core, and that can be replaced. Even in my home, I'm using FIOS, uh, uh, using, uh, let's say, Verizon using FIOS. I'm using that in my house. 
and that can be replaced with a wireless backhaul because of uh, your new radio technology that gives lots of bandwidth, right? So that is the radio side. Then we are slightly moving towards core. Uh, so one of the components is how to define networking network function virtualization. And there's an example of that I'm showing here. Um, so traditionally, you know, around 2013, what happened is the operator community, and I was involved in ETSI, the European uh, Telecommunication Standards Institute. So they, uh, I was in at and at that point. So the operator community thought, you know, they should not be depending on a, a proprietary monolithic uh, uh, vendor solution, rather move to a, a more like network function virtualization, which is softwareization of network functions and make the network more programmable. You know, if you remember, uh, there's a classic paper in 2008, OpenFlow, uh, by folks from MIT, uh, Princeton, uh, Stanford, uh, you know, Washington University and several other places, right? So that kind of, uh, it is NSF funded work and they, they created the uh, actual motivation to make the network more programmable by using, uh, you know, some programmability in the network, right? So. So that kind of triggered. So what happened is people moved away. They kind of came up with a standard common of the cell hardware, uh, Linux operating system, OpenStack framework. So you have a hypervisor or container type. And then you put this softwareization like your routers, switches, and uh, different type of elements in the network. They became virtualized, right? And then you need an orchestration. So that is the whole piece of software defined networking and NFP. And then if you really want to uh, be agile, and uh, receptive to what is happening in the network as quickly as possible, you need some kind of a automation or orchestration, right? There is a, there's an attack happening on your network or there is a performance is going up. How quickly you can reprovision, add or scale up or scale down the network. So you need some kind of a mechanism uh, where you get the alert, then orchestrate and you know take care of the problem. Then mobile edge cloud, a um, lot of this ultra low latency application, um, you know, if you try to, uh, have you know millisecond type or remote surgery type application uh, you really need that to be processed at the local edge cloud so that created the motivation of having uh, edge cloud so most of the operators they only have the cores right 10 to 11 cores spread around the country for example uh, but uh, this uh, with because the ultra low latency yeah. application you have to support you started having lots and lots of edge cloud uh, around your uh, core network right uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So network slicing, um, so what is that? So that's like a, you know, I have an example here on the bottom. So when you are sending a data, it's almost like a high occupancy vehicle in a highway, right? Where uh, if you have a high priority application, you need high bandwidth, you need high processing power, lots of memory, et cetera. And when you're sending a data or signaling path, it touches many components uh, on the way, right? From the handset all the way, if you see on the bottom here, uh, to somebody in the in the network. So you need to make sure you are assigning a right amount of resources along the way. So you create multiple different slices. So you can have a high priority, high bandwidth uh, type application in, in one slice and low priority, maybe in another slice. So you can still use the same and that's being possible because of the virtualization. Then gradually people started thinking, oh, can I apply this network function virtualization on the RAN side? So typically RAN is your access tower. You, everything is uh, all stuck there. So they try to disaggregate that. So you might have heard things like Open RAN Alliance. Um, that's kind of a opening up the network, make it more programmable uh, and uh, see how can put the control on the cloud. And I have a slide on that later on uh, and, and put everything else on, on, on the you know the remote radio head is only on the access tower, right? So you are basically applying the programmability um, across the network. Uh, you know these are the core side, and then you have heterogeneous networks uh, moving between macro cells, small cells, uh, integration with wireless LAN, device to device. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a separation of user plane, control plane. That means. Um, if you are authenticating or things like that, you go to the core of the network. If you are routing the data, they call it data offloading or uh, local breakout, where your user plane is separated from control plane. So that way you can uh, support, you know, when you're moving, handing up uh, from one cell to another cell, another cell, uh, you can do that locally, right? The context of networking, uh, you know, we talked about IoT, and then I know there will be a lot of interesting talks uh, tomorrow also. Uh, Professor Mishra, um, another distinguished lecturer, he'll be talking about IoT um, in a, to a large extent. Uh, please attend that uh, also. 
Uh, and, and so this kind of gives you some of the characteristics, how it is different uh, from 4G. So it is not only the high bandwidth on new radio. There are lots of other core functionality that you have to know. And, and that means you have to have a new protocol, uh, new interaction. You know, those things are also happening at the same time. So if you put everything together here, so you have 5G new radio. You have programmability, network function virtualization uh, in the core, RAN, uh, basically the cloudifying the whole network. Then uh, you have the SDN uh, controller that will help to program your router switches on the fly, what's happening. Then you have slicing to support, uh, you know, different types of application. Okay. And thing on the left hand side is kind of a, you know, very high level picture of if you put everything together, you have uh, cloud RAN, S cloud, core, uh, SDN controller, then uh, you have the slicing, then you have an orchestrator, and then you have some kind of a service management, right? So this, now you get a complete idea of how things look like. Um, I'll go past very briefly and just to give a little bit of idea of how things are transitioning. So remember I talked about the millimeter wave or, or the new radio. Um, so different countries, they are using different types of frequency uh, to support that part, right? And to a large extent is regulated as well. It's not like 8 to 11, which is, um, you know, uh, unlicensed spectrum, right? So you, you have to uh, basically auction that. So many operators, let's say they're using 24, 28, some are using, uh, you know, and 39 gigahertz, and people are even going towards terahertz later on, right? So the, the key difference here is if you're using high frequency, uh, you have high bandwidth, but you have low range. So you need lots of lots of cells. Some operators, they are getting into sub six gigahertz, where uh, you may not need, uh, you know, you may not have that much of capacity, but you have, um, uh, high range. So, so depending on is it urban or uh, you know village type environment, suburban or rural, right? You can pick and choose what is the frequency range you are. And uh, an operator can have both. You can have a macro shell and micro shell too, right? So that is uh, just a global snapshot of 5G spectrum. Then, in terms of actual core, this is what I was talking about. If you see the complexity, I shouldn't say complexity, but basically they're making it more modular. So on the evil packet code, this is how 4G looks like. You, know, you have a user plane and control plane. And over here, they're splitting it up, right? They're doing it microservice. That means each of these signaling component, they are breaking it up. And they have a user plane, like user plane function. And they have a control plane. And in the data plane, where they're actually storing um, all the, uh, all your provisioning the data of the users, right? And some of the things that are happening is more like a service-oriented approach, uh, service-based approach, where uh, they are getting rid of protocols like diameter. They're using more like HTTP, REST API, uh, publish, subscribe type function to make it more agile um, and you know granular. You can say I should say right, and that also helps because you can due to subterization, you can buy one component from one vendor, another component from another vendor. You know as long as they interoperate. Okay, so now let me move a little bit. So how things are transitioning then? So today, uh, people have this, right? This is a 4G, so you have a e node B, long-term evolution, then evolve packet core, and this is again from CGPP, and it's called option one, standalone LTE with EPC. Uh, so things cannot happen overnight, right? Because 5G core is still being defined. If everything is ready today, uh, operators will have a new radio and then 5G core, um, or some operators may even wait until that is completely defined and they start deploying that. Some people are actually deploying already uh, to a large extent uh, 5G core, depending on the service they're offering. So new radio is ready. So most of the operators, what they're doing, uh, transition step option three, where you have uh, E node B and EPC, which is already there, they're adding new radio. So depending on if you're doing a signaling, you go through your E node B, you're sending the data, you directly send it through EPC, I mean, uh, over the uh, new radio, uh, because you already have high bandwidth uh, available, right? So this is kind of a hybrid situation. So most of the operators that are doing that, and there are other options of transition also. At some point, people will move directly to uh, new radio and 5 go. You know, this is just to let you know how things are moving. Okay, I'll skip the slides, just I wanted to tell um, the applicability, remember the first uh, slide I said, um, you have a specific deployment consideration and these are the thing, connection density, um, experience data rate, traffic density, you know, these are the things you have to take into account. And, you know, we are developing, so this is again from 3GPP, uh, within Future Network Initiative, we have an application working group 
where we are trying to map these. Uh, and if you see closely here, you know, dense urban indoor hotspots. So depending on where you are deploying, uh, your uh, this KPIs will be different. And accordingly, you design your network, right? So that is for enhanced mobile broadband. Um, this is for uh, machine to machine type communication, ultra low latency. And over here also, you have certain drivers. Uh, you know, you want to support mission critical services. You need ultra low latency. Uh, you know, these are some of the machine to machine type communication, uh, the connectivity, resource efficiency, the battery, and you know, all those factors you have to take into account uh, when you're deploying any specific uh, type of service. Um, then when you when you do that, once you do that, then you have to apply, right? And this this is just a high level view that we are defining within application working group, like you have a public safety. We had a workshop like two weeks back at APL uh, with Department of Homeland Security and IEEE Fusion Network, where uh, we are trying to see how 5G can help to support variety of application with public safety and, and first responder, right? And this is just a high level example of uh, different components that are needed, uh, what kind of enablers I need, right? Um, what are the different uh, functions I have to provide? Uh, you know, this is for the public safety. And similarly, um, you can go with um, you know, agriculture, uh, you can go with, um, you know, automotive. So each of these verticals, you can map the 5G enablers, right? And go with that. So this, uh, so now I, I switch gear my, to security. Um, so what I said so far is kind of setting the stage what is 5G, how it can be useful to, uh, um, and what is happening right now, how people are doing it. Again, 5G is not only for the operators, you can have your own fri private 5G networks too. Uh, for example, Department of Defense, right? They are uh, setting up uh, 5G test bed to support, uh, you know, the people who are in the battlefield or any kind of uh, uh, defense type work, right? Similarly, uh, past responder community, they can have their own 5G network. Automotive guys, they can have the own. And some point, they obviously have to connect to the operator world, right? But you can still have your own 5G private networks. And you can, have, they call it uh, cell on the wheel, like cold means uh, you can have your ad hoc 5G networks um, on a mobile van, for example. You know, things like in the COVID situation, right? That's going to work pretty well, you know, if you really think about it. So now the security part, now I'm getting into security. So what happens when you think about security is a very complex and abstract notation. What is security, you know, one-on-one, right? You have authentication, confidentiality, integrity, availability. You know, these are some fundamental uh, security requirement um, that you have to keep in mind. When I was in at and I used to work for chief security office there. Um, so I learned a lot there. And before that, I was in a, startup company when um, connection where I actually built a product and um, then I, I found out how it can be useful. So it is, it is important. It should not be an afterthought. Um, it has to be embedded from the very get go. So if you're setting up a 5G network, that point you really need to analyze what are the potential threats, uh, what are the risks, um, risks to the uh, endpoint, uh, my whole network. At the same time, uh, there are also opportunities that come with new enablers and how I can take advantage of those opportunities uh, to enhance my security posture, right? So, so that is important. And once you do that analysis, then you can go back to standards, uh, you know, SA3, for example, in 3GPP, or even within ITP, you have security uh, working group. Anyway, so you go there, work with the vendor operator, then try to see a specific standard is working or not. And there is other things like supply chain security, whether you're buying the right stuff from the right vendor to make sure it is secure. So, so if you want to do that, so you have to make some kind of a risk analysis. Again, I'll just just have one slide to talk about. Um, so what I'm showing here is what is the risk factor, and I tell you why we need that. So you see the likelihood of happening in a specific threat, uh, and then what is the impact? How bad it is? How bad my customers are going to be affected? What is the business criticality? And if you do that, then you can come up with your risk factor, right? So you know the risk factor, that now you look at your security controls, if it's a high risk, but I don't have enough security controls, so I need to augment my network to add those security controls, right? So that's how you approach. So first, before you anything you do, you have to look at the potential points of attack that could happen. So this is where I'm talking about an end-to-end -end view. Uh, again, it's a very high level, I know uh, it's a short talk, but I wanted to give you look at the threat vectors. How do you approach this in a systematic way, right? So what you are seeing here, a very high level view of 5G, you have endpoints, 
you have access tower, they call it Gnode B. You have S Cloud, you have connectivity to a Wi Fi type network, you have user plane, control plane, data plane that I showed. Uh, you have new elements like orchestration, SDN controller that I talked about. Uh, if you are supporting voice over IP, um, you know, you have be using IP multimedia subsystem type network. If you're just streaming the network, you go to internet, you may have roaming providers. So once you open it up, and there are different types of interfaces. If you go to 3GPP, I think is uh, 502, uh, 501, 501, you'll see what these things are, how they're defined, you know, um, then you what protocol they use, etc. So now I, tr I start looking at where the attacks might come from. It can come from my endpoint. Um, they may do flooding. Uh, somebody may jam my network. Uh, somebody can even do bad things uh, to my G node B, which is my access tower, and go and change the configuration. Uh, it may happen man in the middle attack from G node B to H cloud or mid haul or back haul, they call it, right? And uh, people can uh, snoop and change things around there. Um, if you have H cloud where you're supporting ultra low latency application um, because you're doing softwareization. Um, you may have some kind of a site signal attacks from one virtual network function to another network function. Um, your attacks could come from Wi-Fi network. You know, there have been a lot of interesting research um, where they've seen potential attacks that might come from Wi-Fi uh, as well because you have uh, integrating that, right? And then you have insider attacks, uh, which is a malicious insider. Somebody may gain access uh, to the database or credential. So you have to have proper controls to take care of that. Then you're adding new stuff like orchestrator SDN controller, which are mostly using API type communication. So you need to be receptive about what are the potential risks there. Is my API secure? Is my northbound API, southbound API are properly uh, authenticated? And people who are communicating that, they have proper access control. And then things may happen from the internet side. Um, it is true, people have firewalls, uh, but sometimes the firewalls are not properly configured. The access control list may not be uh, good, maybe some ports are um, open, uh, DNS port is open, or some other port is open, right? So in that case, um, they may find the hole and come and attack some of my networking assets. And then things may ha happen from the roaming providers. See, if I'm in AT&T here, I go to India, for example, and I my, my home subscriber is AT&T, and then, you know, I, I'm there are potential attacks in SS7, for example, we had, that has been taken care of, but so people have been you have to take into account those things. So this is a very high level kind of view of uh, that threat analysis. So once you do that, then you come up with a taxonomy. So you're kind of going through a little bit of um, systematic way. Uh, so as I was telling before, when you use a security requirement, uh, some of the thing you have to keep in mind, is my network available? Is my data con confidentiality is not compromised? My integrity is not compromised? Um, is somebody else taking control of my network? Right, so these are the things you have to keep in mind. But if I'm a hacker, right, um, I can think about how to make the network unavailable. I can see how I can compromise the confidentiality, right? So I think about that way. I can flood an interface across a network element, and how do I do that? You know, I can keep on sending. You know, you know, uh, I can be a bad guy and just keep on sending lots of lots of authentication attached requests, or even unknowingly my uh, handset, maybe botnet or malware, right? It can keep on sending lots of lots of traffic. So I can flood the whole network interface and the bandwidth. I can cross the network limit by sending a malform packet. And I can do ifs drop. I can change the parameters like SIP header, um, uh, you know, the header or, or resource priority header like RPH, you know, some of those which are supposed to be uh, for fast responder. I can change those. So instead of getting a, a high quality service, it the degradation happens, right? And then I can change things in the protocol. I can go through the management interface and, and you know make things bad. So these are the attack descriptions. So once you know that, then you think about your mitigation technique, right? So that's important. And then you look at your risk and see what are the problems you have. So this is how uh, is is good to approach. I've just gave one example of 5G, but this could be applicable to 4G. It could be any any enterprise. So you have to do a threat analysis like that. So now what is new in 5G then, right? So now that you have a little bit of idea and I'll, I'll speak some of the use cases here, I call it uh, key pillars for 5G and beyond. Uh, so I talked about the virtual RAN, uh, SDN, 
open source, uh, API security, slicing, uh, virtualization, softwareization, uh, data privacy, and you know, most of the time we are doing a reactive way. Uh, can I use AI ML to do predictive security? Uh, I'm putting mobile edge cloud. What are the pros and cons of that? Uh, then supply chain security is uh, something completely different, a different domain, but it is important because uh, you saw those threat vectors. So if I'm putting the right, if I'm not putting the right component from the right vendors, or trusted vendors, then I may run into problems. So uh, we have to keep that in mind. So what I'll do, um, I'll go with some of these uh, opportunities and challenges for each of these, right, in my next uh, set of slides. But I wanted to uh, give you an idea why we, what we did here is to really extrapolate some of the additional things that got added because of 5G. That doesn't mean that we have forget about existing threats. The existing threats like access control, those things are going to stay anyway, right? But you got to augment our network with all of these. So, so I'll start with SDN NAP, and I think by now um, you probably know what is uh, SDN NAP. So this is how things used to look like. People moved away from that. And this is the Etsy NAP thing where you have common of the self hardware uh, operating system, then you have the NAPs, right? And this is how it used to look like with uh, different vendors, multiple vendors, multiple hardware, different operating system, things became complex. So they moved away from that and this is, this is what happened. And so basically, uh, if you look at this one, this is how the traditional networking used to look like. And because you're adding the programmability on uh, virtualization, et cetera, and you have the general purpose hardware, uh, you have network services, these all become virtualized, right? Then analytics, orchestration, policy, this is this operational control. Um, so from this type of network, it become more programmable, uh, you know, software defined, you know, this is how the foundation of 5G, right? Uh, then how operators are doing it, again, this is from Etsy. So if you look at it, this is an operation view where you have a fixed, uh, you have a fixed access. I mean, this is the wireless, this is the fixed, and they have to do it um, stepwise as well. You know, the initially, let's say they started with fixed access, then move to the core, then they are now they're virtualizing the RAN. So this also happens in tandem, right? But I wanted to show how the, how an operator network look like, an enterprise network look maybe look, look different. Okay. Uh, this is another example of security. Talking about security, how potentially and you know, what you're seeing here in non-virtualized security where you have firewall IDS, IPS from different vendors, and some of them are listed here. If you want to move it to a virtualized uh, type uh, function, you are having a common cloud infrastructure. Then we have virtual DDoS, virtual firewall, and virtual IDS. These are from different vendors, mix and match, right? Then you have operational management framework and virtualized security functions. So this is how uh, things transition from non-virtualized security to virtualized security function. Uh, this is just a use case of uh, effect of SDN and NAP, at least for the security part. And if I put this together, this is how it's, it's look, looking like, right? I have, I call it predictive security, but uh, right now it is reactive in the sense, if I have a SDN controller, I have an orchestration, so by now you know what those are, then I have different security function, the virtual DDoS that will detect there is a denial of service attack happening. Um, then, I can get it from a vendor one because now it is all software, right? I can get an IDS, which is intrusion detection system from another vendor. An intrusion prevention system I get from another vendor, right? And here I have my data analytics that sends me the alerts. So this is one example of the closed loop automation. I have an SDN fabric. Um, here I'm using hypervisor. I can use container as well. And my attack could come from data plane or control plane. I talked about, right? I can send lots of lots of packet to attach storm. I can say malware traffic. So I need to have ability to uh, detect that analytics, monitor that first of all, send the analytics to the orchestration. So in this case, I'm showing how you can use SDN controller to service chain different security function. So let's say initially um, you have DDoS function, you see a traffic spike. At that point, you really don't know where the attack is coming from. So you get that, then in, the, you instantiate your virtual IDS uh, it could be from different vendor and service chain them. Then you do the analytics and you see it's coming from this IP address, this uh, IMEI, iPhone, whatever, right? This location and where it is going. So once you do that deep packet inspection and which protocol, is it a TCP attack or SIP attack, attack or whatever, right? Different types of attack. 
Uh, you can see the protocol, you can see the port number, then you instantiate your intrusion protection system or prevention system here by firewall by changing the uh, access control list. So what you're doing here for the northbound API, you are getting this and southbound API, you are uh, configuring and programming that. So in a way, if you detect that quickly, you can mitigate that uh, uh, you know, quickly as well by doing this programmability. Now, the question is, where do you want to put it? Do you want to put it in the radio access network, in the edge cloud or in the core? So it depends, you know, where, um, what you want to uh, protect and how quickly you want to detect and protect. And each one has its implication. So this is just one example of the uh, network function virtualization and SDN, the, the, the opportunity, okay? So you got a little bit idea there how uh, SDN and MP, the opportunities work, but I'll talk about some, um, uh, the problems that we have to solve later on. Um, so now I'm going through step by step one use case. So here I'm talking about Cloud RAN, okay? So Cloud RAN means typically uh, when you see this radio head, right, all the cell towers, most of the software function now integrated at the same time, same place, right? Now people are moving away and this is an example of Open RAN Alliance. Some of you uh, probably watching it and following it uh, It's very, um, actually used to be called XRAN then became ORAN. And um, so the idea is to move the control out and leave the radio remote radio head in the cell sites and your uh, control uh, plane and you know data plane, all those stuff um, uh, are put in the in the cloud. So then you'll have the ability uh, to do a lot of you know scale up, scale down kind of thing. And and this is how I'm showing, right? You can still have your virtual firewall, DDoS, IDS, and third party uh, software in the cloud. And now this is your RAN, right? Then you go to backhaul, which could be S Cloud or Core. So this has some uh, potential opportunities uh, in terms of security and also uh, challenges. So this is where I'm showing that. Um, so now the column, let me see. So first column is security opportunities. So what are by by doing Open RAN or Cloud RAN? Uh, what are the opportunities I'm getting in terms of security. Obviously my programmability and virtualization, you know, that will adapt to the dynamic nature of traffic. I can have multi-provider access. I can embed my denial of service attack and mitigation detection stuff in the cloud so that I can detect it ahead of time, right? Like a S detection. Um, I have the ability to do uh, dynamic resource, uh, radio resource scheduling. Uh, so I can uh, reduce the risk of jamming attacks or the mitigate that. Uh, I have the ability to correlate the control plane and data plane right there. So these are the opportunities that I can take advantage of in terms of improving the resiliency of the network. But at the same time, what I'm showing here is some of the challenges. You know, I haven't listed everything. And then I am associating the risk security and threat likelihood for each of the security um, problem that I, I might face. So one of them, I'll just take one or two examples and move on. Uh, so denial of service attack, billions of IoT devices, uh, if they do that, I may have to spin up more uh, virtual function to detect that and stop them. But at the same time, they might result in this starvation uh, for the actual CRAN functions, right? So there may be uh, virtual machines, they may do data exfiltration or virtualization. So, and maybe the orchestration, you know, some of the time when you're scaling up, scaling down, they may be under attack. So if you have those, then you think about potential mitigation technique and look at the risk factor. And then you design your network again, right? So this is an example of Cloud RAN. So that's one pillar. The next pillar is uh, mobile edge cloud security. So now you know why you need as cloud to support ultra low latency application. But at the same time, I like to make sure it's secure. So, so this kind of a trade off, right? Security is always acts against performance in the sense, if I'm handing over quickly, and I have to authenticate myself every time I uh, hand over, I set up my IPsec or authentication, Typically, people go all the way to the core to get authenticated and it takes time. So, so you have to probably put some security context and local authentication, things like that in the edge, uh, but that will increase the vulnerability. So you, you want to make sure, so you, there's a trade off here. So how do I, if, how do I, if I my security context I'm putting in the A's, uh, how do I make sure it is not compromised, right? Uh, at the same time, I get the right quality of service. So here, uh, again, in the same tone, um, the security monitoring I'm embedding in the edge, uh, my performance optimization, reduce latencies, <clears throat> secure and fast data, by moving the security context to the edge. Uh, but this, by doing that, I'm exposing a lots of uh, interesting problems here. You know, first of all, I'm 
my third party application coexist with uh, my actual BNFs, my edge cloud, uh, my storage of security context at the edge that can lead to malicious spoofing attack. Um, I may uh, be subjected to um, you know cache poisoning and cache overwhelming because a lot of things you are depending on the cache and the local edge. Um, then if I'm doing context transfer uh, proactively when I'm handing over, um, I may be, uh, there may be a potential eavesdropping problem. Um, sometimes as I talk, 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 talk to you about authentication, so in most cases they may probably do subscriber authentication in the visited network uh, while they're doing the actual AKA in the back end, right? The, so temporary security association. So how do I make sure it is expired um, and timely, right? Um, while I'm doing that. So once you do that, then you think about, uh, do I have proper access control? Um, uh, is there data at risk? Are they properly encrypted? Uh, do I have any monitoring? Uh, because I'm doing too many back and forth between S Cloud and my core. And, you know, do I have any um, monitoring agent to see nobody is actually doing any kind of man in the middle attack, right? And then look at your risk, security and threat likelihood and um, proceed accordingly. Um, next one is the slicing. Um, so, so slicing example, you know, uh, let's let's go back what we talked about slicing, and this is an example here. So I have different type of application: ultra low latency, massive IoT, uh, mission critical, non mission critical, right? And as you are seeing here, these are my VNFs for S Cloud. Um, I have uh, these are the signaling uh, component. I have a data component, like I call it V means virtual. Uh, you, if you try to remember the component, I have a picture here. Anyway, so these are data plane, control plane, user plane uh, entity. And I, if I am supporting a, um, a critical type application, I need to make sure that gets um, uh, executed right here on the edge, and they have enough um, uh, capacity, enough memory, and, and users, etc. Right. So I'm creating a slice, many various slices, even within the same component. The problem here is um, there are potential risks here. Um, so one UE may be connected to a different type slice, and one slice may use a different protocol, security protocol, than another one. Um, there may be site channel attack uh, because I'm using two slices. One is, uh, let's say, has a different security implication than the other one. Um, there may be uh, impersonation attacks, and I'm trying to provision the slicing or dynamically provision the slicing. Uh, that may be a problem there. So while slicing provides us some opportunities, like uh, enabling service differentiation, isolating the highly sensitive context application from non-critical application, uh, context or orchestration optimization. You know, sometimes you know people use multi-layer security. If I can use slice, I may not have all the multi-layer security. Maybe you know, as long as I secure the slice. Uh, so these are the opportunities that you can take advantage of by using slicing. And but the challenges wise, I talked about right some of those um, uh, slice one slice attacking another slice, uh, stealing the resources from uh, another slice, uh, stealing between slices when one user endpoint is connected, impersonation and attacks, etc. Uh, and then that case, um, I have to for each of these case again, I have to think about the potential uh, mitigation technique. Can I cap the resources so that slice cannot uh, steal my resources? Uh, I can ring fence the resources. Um, avoid the co-hosting of slices at different levels of sensitivity. And there are so and so forth, right? So, so these are the ways you have to think about and then look at the risk security and threat likelihood and look at your uh, security controls that you have. So this is interesting. And um, we talked about the opportunities of SDN controller, right? Uh, how you can easily program uh, whatever is happening in the network, you get that and just change programmability, right? So this is you know, a very high level example of how you can stop the attack uh, by configuring, uh, you're getting through northbound API and southbound API, you are configuring the firewalls and the fly. Um, there are different kinds of problems with SDN um, environment and controller. I'm talking about controller. One of the thing is if you're using open source, and this is an example I had in 2014, external XML entity attack. Sometimes if these are not properly um, scanned, there may be holes, a hacker may get in and start changing the configuration. Um, the other example would be um, what I'm showing here is an example of an SDN controller gets completely overwhelmed. It gets bogus requests, thousands of requests. Okay, I have thousands of routers or firewalls that need to be configured. And so it gets all these requests and then um, you know start configuring. Uh, and we actually did that in a mini net. 
you know, some students, if you're listening to this, you can try. This could be a pretty interesting project for you guys. You know, in Johns Hopkins, we are doing a capstone project. Some students are doing it. Um, they are looking into potential uh, SDN controller attacks and what are the mitigation techniques um, they have to do. And you can actually do it in your own lab, uh, set up a whole open source SDN controller and use a mini net to emulate your network. And it's a very interesting project, right? So, so, so for that also now, um, I have provided here some of the opportunities. Obviously, SDN controller provides resiliency to attack overload programmability, uh, dynamic service chaining, we saw that, um, you know, security control mechanism, so how quickly you detect and mitigate that, right? But uh, comes with it, uh, we have lots of challenges. I talked about some of those, the northbound API, southbound API, protocol fuzzing attack, controller impersonation attack, right? So mostly it is uh, API related, and some could be a configuration related as well. Um, so for that, you need to have proper SDN scanner, uh, system logging, API monitoring, you know, these are some of the mitigation techniques you need to um, think about. Now, so we talked mostly about the operator type network, right? Um, but things could happen in a data center. And this is an example from HCNAP again. Uh, I'm showing two types of data center, data center one, data center two. And if, if you are doing virtualization, this is mostly virtualization threat. It could be applicable to an operator network or enterprise. Here I'm showing a data center type environment where you have a, a virtual machine manager, kind of a hypervisor host OS, and these are different VMs. And that there are many kinds of attack may happen. It can happen from application to VM, one VM to another VM. Uh, over here, if you go through it, attack from VMs in the same domain, attacks to the host, hypervisor and VM from application in the host machine. Um, it could be uh, uh, from the application communicating with the VMs. It could happen from the remote um, management path uh, or edge network, like your double uh, setup boxes or residential gateway, right? It could happen from there because they're all virtualized now. Uh, and it can happen from an, another data center. They call it um, north-south traffic. And if it's happening within the data center, like east-west, right? So you, you have to also be um, thinking about how to protect those. And if I try to also put that in kind of virtualization management, what are the problems here? So opportunities wise, obviously, um, I have the ability to scale up. If there is a denial of service attack happening, um, I can add additional VNFs on the fly until the attack subsides. So they call it, um, uh, recover fast, resolve next, right? Or you can do that in parallel. So uh, if I have the virtualization SDN, I can scale up my MMEs or scale up any network function uh, so that I can withstand the denial of service attack. At the same time, I'm checking who is attacking it. So I can, once I take care of it, I can scale down. So you can scale up and scale down on the fly. Um, but in virtualization, there are some uh, security challenges like a lack of visibility, network traffic, um, execution of VMs at different trust level. Some of the time, your catalog is compromised. Uh, if you are uh, placing a VNF virtual network function, instead of placing uh, the right place, the hacker may steal it and change it and put it in a different place, right? Uh, so those are the wrong placements. So how do I make sure orchestrator is not compromised? The communication from the orchestrator to um, you know, VNF is not compromised, right? So those are different use cases you have to think about and, and see the potential mitigation technique, right, for that. Um, and I'm running out of time. I know it started a little late, but I'll, I'll finish it up soon. Um, so then the, the other one is the open source or API security. I, I put it in the same category, but um, open source has lots of advantages. And you see on the right-hand side, uh, different types of open source you have, like orchestration, like ONAP. Uh, OPNAP, um, you have uh, SDN controller like uh, ONOS and ODL, OpenRAN, right? OpenStack, which is, uh, you know, the Acumos. So these are different uh, open source community uh, where even you can go and get involved and build your own testbed. So it has its own advantages. You can see here, you know, flexibility, agility, um, faster time to market. But there are lots of, you know, there are some disadvantages that you have to think about, uh, level of support, lack of documentation, you know, you have to make sure that the code is uh, hard enough before you actually 
um, put it on your network, right? So these are the, some of the things you have to also keep in mind. And then finally, the supply chain security, which is uh, important. Um, as you can see here, I'm giving a um, some, like if you look at the user equipment, um, you have radio access network. So now you know how 5G network looks like. Then you have a core network. And then you have vendors that provide uh, your antenna, some vendors that provide power amplifier, processor, chip, etc. right? And this comes from uh, companies around the world. Uh, so if I am designing my network and putting my components, um, I need to make sure uh, the component I'm putting uh, coming from vendor X, Y, or Z uh, are properly uh, secure. Uh, and you know, if, when they apply a new patch or things like that, uh, there is no trap or nothing which will uh, um, do, uh, lead to data leakage or take my traffic out and give it to somebody else. Uh, so we have to be uh, cognizant of that, and it's important um, for the community to really go to standards and make sure the best current practice uh, is being followed um, before a vendor uh, delivers equipment. So in terms of the standards organization, I think uh, I went over it already, but this is just a sample thing, you know, ITF, which obviously um, all the protocols we use today are developed by ITF, Internet Engineering Task Force, right? And they started looking into dynamic service chaining in, in, in the context of uh, 5G and uh, SDN and FB, 3GPP we talked about, uh, HC, uh, they are probably the first um, group that started looking into SDN and FB and virtualization and, and the security. There are about 17 different drafts on the security side if you take a look. Um, IEEE obviously has been um, developing lots of lots of standards, but with respect to um, 5G, um, the, as part of Future Network Initiative, there are about 26 societies uh, who are contributing to different aspects of standards roadmap. Uh, you know, obviously, 802AX, ACY is just one example, but uh, there are other layers of standards also being defined. Then ONF, OPNFB, Open Air Interface, Open Daylight, Open Reliance. So these are the open source community uh, if you really want to build your testbed. And then finally, I wanted to talk about one example of power testbed with NSF. Uh, uh, platform for advanced wireless research. Um, there are a uh, few test beds out there, like Cosmos, New York City at Columbia University with Rutgers and um, NYU, uh, Powdered Salt Lake in Salt Lake City, and uh, this is North Carolina State University. So they are building another one with rural broadband. So these are the test beds where if, if you become part of the consortium member or through IEEE also, you can um, get access to that. Then Linux Foundation, and there are a lot of regulatory bodies, right? So it's important to know what's going on there. Now, if you want to really build your own testbed, you know, some of your students, it's important to have your uh, hands-on experience. Uh, it will help you, right? So, for example, um, anybody in NIT Road Killer or anywhere in the world, if you're watching this, um, you can really build your own testbed with emulation, uh, getting your all the SDN controller, orchestrator, virtual DDoS, uh, IMS, all those things you can put together and build your own testbed. So, you know, you just just go to those open source and take a look. And this is one example I'm giving my personal experience how we built a testbed and we did this uh, just the application of uh, three use cases, malicious URL detection, mitigation, uh, mal malware detection, mitigation, application control. So what you're seeing here is a 4G network and we have virtualized IDS. We uh, monitor different traffic, correlate that and uh, we found out who is doing the attack, who is downloading the malware, and um, how we found out and stopped it, right? And I'll give you some screenshot of that, but this is a, a one example of the closed loop automation. We did not use SDN controller here. We just used 3GPP, the radio access bureau notification request uh, to, to detect and stop the attack. So the, the key important part is the, having the ability to detect what is happening, right? So we um, actually looked at the control part and data plane. So this is your data plane. This is your control plane. Then we found out the, all the details of the UE. So example is here. This is the, um, uh, the company actually I used to work for long back. But here, um, what I was showing here is, in this case, blacklist detection of dynamic security controls. So one UE is going to a wrong uh, URL. You get, the, uh, you get the alert. You see that alert thing. And then once you know that, you put your access control list and you stop it. Um, this is with the malware detection. If a UE is um, downloading a, a document that is malware, you have right signature, you can detect that, and then you can see if you look closely, there are details of the IP address, MEI, and everything. So once you know that, you know the flow, port number, and IP address, some source and destination, you can uh, 
uh, augment your access control list uh, either by using SDN or anything else you like, right? And you, we stop the attack. Um, so here, uh, you know, actually throttling is the wrong term, but we kind of stop the, uh, in this case, let's say a specific user, uh, this is almost like a theft of service, right? Um, a sub certain user is not supposed to be using certain type of bandwidth, certain application, but you see there's a spike. Uh, and you find out which specific uh, user um, is actually doing that and which specific application it is doing, then you have the ability to um, change the QCI value or quality of service for that specific bearer, or you can stop it if you want, except for make, you know, the person can do an emergency service. So this is how you can detect the even theft of service. Um, so that, those are some examples of what you can do within your own network. Uh, but this is an example I was talking about NSF's, uh, the uh, platform for advanced wireless research. Um, I mean, one example I'm giving here, because Johns Hopkins APL, we are part of the consortium. So we have our own internal test bed, but we are also connecting uh, to the different test beds, right? Uh, you can see here. So you have the ability uh, to do lots of tests outside in a scalable way. For example, in Salt Lake City, they're focusing on Masi MIMO, um, IoT type use case. In, in Columbia University here, Cosmos, they are using millimeter wave, uh, ultra high bandwidth, you know, that kind of in a city environment. This is a campus environment. Uh, North Carolina State University, they are doing um, drone-based uh, interesting um, ex experiment, right? The Coliseum that used to be at APL now moved Northeastern University, and they do a lot kind of channel simulator type work. Um, they are building up a new, um, this is still TBD location, uh, rural broadband type. So I know within India also, uh, there are lots of lots of interesting test beds. Um, you should take advantage of that as well. So this is a good way to um, build your own test bed internally. At the same time, try to get involved into um, other external test bed. And you know, I, I'll send these slides, but this kind of shows depending on what resources they have, um, you can choose your own test bed, I mean, use case, and talk to the PI, the principal investigator of these uh, um, test bed and, and, and communicate with them and see what kind of experiment you can do, right? So this is an example of Salt Lake City, like campus type, um, and here in, in New York uh, City, like Upper West Side near Columbia, where, uh, you know, I, I used to work there and I studied there also, so this is uh, pretty close to my heart. Um, haven't been there for a while due to COVID, but uh, so here you can actually uh, do millimeter type um, experiment. This is the Columbia campus here, right? Um, you a sm a smart uh, intersection, uh, you know, densification of cell. So there is a Mobicom paper, I think, uh, based on this, you can take a look at some of the experiments. Um, so finally, what is happening here? Uh, key points of 5G adoption. So I kind of give you a very high level view, right, so far. Uh, but if you're really looking into the actual uh, adoption of, of 5G and beyond, uh, th you know, there are some technical barriers, but that is easy. We can, you know, obviously put our minds together and try to come up with a solution for each of those. You know, there are a lot of work going in the spectrum sharing, dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, there are RF issues, uh, the complexity in the sense, uh, things like Microsoft service, open source, uh, you know, the transition, right? So some of those complexity we have to deal with. Um, there are cultural barriers. You might be hearing a lot of this uh, uh, news, whether it's a health issue or hazard issue, environmental issues. So we have a, within Feature Network Initiative, we have a deployment working group. Uh, David Witkowski is one of the co-chair. Um, he's into, he's actually looking into um, some of those. He's having town hall meetings for different municipality, talking to the people. And there are, I mean, I personally have done that as well when I was visiting Europe. And so there are references there. There is no hard and fast thing that this is true. That's not true. Um, people are still investigating, and sometimes people just put out news just to get some create some news. But it has to be done scientifically, right? So that's one thing. Uh, then on the policy barriers, uh, vendor interoperability, supply chain issues. This is becoming a big big thing now, uh, roaming among operators. And then you know going forward, dynamic spectrum sharing, uh, use of low band, mid band. Uh, use of unlicensed band. You know, this is also, uh, you know, FCC is doing a lot of good things there. Uh, so you need to think about that. Um, so in summary, um, for the technical part, maybe I'll spend five minutes just to talk about future network. But um, so, so the fundamental uh, motivation of having new network evolution is uh, we need to support new types of application. For that, we need a network end-to-end. -end. 
that has to be adaptable, resilient, uh, and flexible, right? Because the applications are emerging. Um, and you know, in the, in case of 5G, obviously there are um, new enablers, um, as you saw, as um slicing, edge cloud, etc. Right? But so each of those um, and Open RAN, each of them have some uh, benefits, but they also give rise to some additional security pillars, and we we saw some of those. So while we take advantage of the opportunities which I have listed here, you also need to make take care of the challenges that it come with. Do a complete threat analysis, look at the uh, existing control you have, uh, and find out the mitigation technique. So in order to do that, you really have to have a systematic approach. And I uh, gave very briefly how to do that. And uh, look at the take inventory of your security controls that investigate that to mitigate that, right? And then you implement your best current practice. And this may be different from different operator, different enterprise owner, um, because they may have different security controls. And every time you keep looking for additional threats, you cannot just, okay, I build my network, I put my firewalls, everything, I just keep quiet. You know, you have to have some investment for security. So finally, the last two, uh, it is cannot be just one person's job, uh, you know, operators, vendors, regulators, academia, they all have to get together you know, in events like this. Um, within Future Network, we have been doing lots of this 5G World Forum, 5G Summit, Communication Society, and the conferences, panels. You know, th This have to happen, and you need to have people from different verticals to collaborate and uh, exchange the ideas. Uh, and then uh, there's a standard, there's a test, but there's a proof of concept, right? So these are the things, uh, it has to be an iterative process, right? It's not like standard is defined, but there is a problem in standard you work with the operator and see a proof of concept, then go back to standard and fix it, right? So that's how it has to happen. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. So what is happening in the future network? So that's my technical part, but because there are many people are listening, I wanted to uh, make sure how we can be part of future network initiative and still um, contribute uh, to it, right? Um, so future network initiative is one of the future direction committee. Uh, it's like an incubator for IEEE. And you can see uh, there are many of the uh, initiative, they kind of graduated. When I say graduated, means the, it gets incubated within future direction, and then it gets absorbed by different societies, right? So depending on your interest um, and expertise, you can actually get involved in any of these, right? So I'm going to talk about just uh, IEEE Future Networks briefly, just to let you know how you can get involved. So when we started the Future Network Initiative, it was 5G Initiative in 2016, but then we changed it to future network because we started looking into 5G and beyond. So there are several working groups here, education, publication, roadmap, conference, standards, and there are co-chairs here. Um, Brad Loja is our staff director, and I'm one of the co-chairs here. Um, Gerard Fettweiss, who was or also one of our founding co-chair, but you know he stepped down, he had other things to take care of, but I just wanted to acknowledge him. So here, what each of these working groups have different things like webinar, podcast, uh, you can get involved in the publication effort. I'll focus on the roadmap. We have 5G World Forum uh, workshop. So today's uh, this this workshop, um, Future Network Initiative, um, is um, actually glad to be a technical co-sponsor uh, because we thought this is important. And we keep doing that. We have been with Communication Society. We have done about 71 5G summits. Um, there was one in Kolkata section in 2017, and Chennai, you know, Bangalore, and different places. 5G World Forum that happened. In bank, actually, it was virtual. It was with with the help of Bangalore section. We um, did that in September 10, 11, 12, right? So there are many societies, as I said, they contribute to this. Uh, the stakeholders from the industry. We got about 300 uh, industry advisory board members. We collaborated with government, academia, students, standards association, educational activities. Um, so. Uh, there are many things happen, not only standards, as I said, and you have the opportunity to get involved in any of these. Uh, this is the website if you really want to um, get to know more details uh, and how to get involved. There are lots of interesting resources there. Uh, you want to write a new paper, work in progress paper. You want to host a workshop. You want to speak, podcast. Um, the most important thing I want to highlight is the roadmap. We are developing a three-year, five-year, ten-year um, roadmap uh, just to augment the effort that's happening or complement the effort that's happening in other standards, but like 3GPP or NGM and other places, uh, because we believe um, IEEE with 46 societies, 
they bring expertise from uh, different parts. You can build a new chip, you can build a new protocol, uh, you know, uh, new uh, computer operating system. So depending on uh, what you need, uh, we need an ecosystem for uh, roadmap, right? Um, so if you see here, there are like uh, 15 different working groups that spread across, um, um, you know, different parts of the network, you know, hardware, massive MIMO, satellite, uh, security, test bed, millimeter wave, uh, connecting the unconnected. This is a recent one with Sudhir Dikhit we are doing. Uh, in fact, the white paper is available. How to make sure, um, you know, the benefit of 5G gets translated to people who are not connected. Uh, you know, 50% of the people do not have broadband access. Uh, AI, ML, optics, um, we are beginning to look into uh, 5G and beyond towards 6G. The first edition is available. Uh, you can take a look. Um, and, you know, these are the things I was talking about, different... Uh, uh, working group uh, uh, chapters uh, which are available and if you really want to get involved um, these are the working groups here if you have a new idea uh, if you want to get uh, you can send mail to this and i'll share this slide anyway and these are the co-chairs for each of those uh, we meet bi-weekly you have you can contribute to the white paper or roadmap document you can um, also hold a workshop. We are having a workshop coming up, systems optimization in December, another one in security in January. So each of these, uh, we also invite a lot of uh, webinar speakers, uh, podcast speakers, if you'd like to get involved. This is kind of the leadership team. If you want to uh, reach out to any of us, uh, please do that. Um, so, so finally, you know, whether you're a platform provider, operator, manufacturers, uh, content provider, uh, student, faculty, uh, scientist, uh, you know, there is an interesting place to cultivate those ideas and uh, come up with new um, technology to support the future network. So it's kind of my last slide. I know I went over a little bit. Um, I wanted to give you an idea. The technical part is separate than this one where uh, there is an opportunity for people around the world uh, to get involved in IEEE's uh, future network initiative and contribute to it uh, in various ways, depending on your interest and expertise and availability of time. So with that, uh, thank you again for inviting me uh, to give a talk. Um, if you have any question, I'll be happy to take this question, you know, depending on if you have time. Thank you again, Professor Das and Professor Dave. Thank you, Professor Dutta. Now I invite questions from participants, which will be addressed by Professor Dutta. Thank you, Madam. Uh, hi, Dr. Dutta. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, excellent presentation, sir. I am Annapurna from NITR. I have a few questions, sir. Uh, sir, how to deal with isolation problem? in network slicing when it is deployed in uh, real time uh, scenarios like uh, industrial automation when we are using or any vehicular network isolation problem how to deal with it sir? right right good question right so uh, let me go back to that slide so first of all um, uh, let me go back to the slide so i can explain it well um, so when you say slicing uh, it is a is an end to end uh, phenomenon right um, and I'm giving an example of that. So if you are, uh, and let's take two examples, if I'm massive IoT type, it may uh, need certain types of resources. On the other hand, if you're doing massive content, it may not need that much, right? Um, so, so depending on which component is using a specific slice. So let's say slice two is, uh, you're doing signaling, right? So slice two, yes, uh, massive IoT, you are connecting to AMF and massive content uh, also initially you have to go through the signaling, right? So yes. your virtual AMF um, is getting, uh, the resources is getting sliced. Now massive IoT may be use, using the virtual AMF uh, too many times because you're doing attached, detached, attached, detached kind of thing. On the other hand, massive content, maybe not, right? So you may have to assign different types of resources there. Now your, your question is, um, how do you isolate that? You know, that is what um, I was showing here. Um, you know, you can have one slice maybe attacking another slice and taking the resources, right? So there are potential ways uh, even to look at the slicing to slicing. They call it east-west traffic. If you happening within the same uh, virtual and BNF, um, you have to monitor that. 
uh, you have to also apply the ring fencing or, you know, see one good part of the virtualization on OpenStack is, um, they call it ring around ring, actually. My boss used to call it. Um, so you can put different types of um, security policies. Uh, if you have a high priority slice, you put, um, you know, different types of security policies around it um, compared to your non-priority slices, right? So, yeah, but that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, one more question for uh, the security part that uh, when we are considering the mobile uh, edge uh, communication or uh, the edge users at that time uh, to reduce the complexity, generally we are preferring for the federated learning models. Then in right. that condition also, uh, the training and the data is constantly transmitted from edge devices to the core network. In those cases, how to ensure uh, that uh, you have already mentioned, sir, uh, predictive security with AIML. So how to ensure for edge devices in those cases? Yeah, yeah. So so I think um, that's a good question. So we had a um, panel three weeks back, uh, Dr. Rajiv Suri, you know, with the ACM. AIML panel, SEM India, I don't know if some of you attended. We, we discussed some of those uh, um, algorithms, how it can be used. Uh, so I think your, your question is excellent, right? Um, so what is happening in terms of uh, AIML predictive security, you are looking at the uh, behavioral pattern or data learning um, from the, what is what has happened in the past. So even before that happens, um, you, you know this is going to happen and you put your uh, security controls in place. I think what you're talking about here is more like uh, uh, mm -hmm. communication between your ACE cloud and uh, and your HSS, right? Exactly. Um, right, right. So, so there are, um, so one way, you know, the, the, the reactive way of doing it is uh, to make sure you have your, uh, and I think I have come up with here. So if you're doing, um, say over here, if you have a delegated subscriber server, uh, which is sitting in the edge, and you have HSS, which is in the core, right? Uh, so while you're doing the temporary association, you're running this whole um, AKA algorithm from home network and acquiring a new security association. So th that that part you have to um, somehow make sure is secure and monitor and encrypted, et cetera. But I think your question is different. How do you apply uh, the, the algorithm, AI algorithm to uh, protect? Is that your question? How do you protect that? Um, so yes, exactly. uh, sir, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, I was asking that uh, when we are uh, pushing the learning towards the edge, then in that condition, uh, the data is uh, learned at the edge and the control is at the core network. Then in those condition, uh, uh, ensuring security in the, that type of uh, method will be a difficult. So how to ensure or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I get your point. So, so I mean, I think I have listed some of those here. Um, if you're you're storing a lot of security context at the edge, how do you take care of your cache poisoning uh, problem, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing I'm thinking, if you're doing lots of handoff, you know, talking about learning algorithm, um, you can perhaps look at the data. If I'm doing, uh, you know, high mobility how quickly, um, how much time I'm taking to authenticate, right? And you can use that data perhaps to use proper security control. Um, I mean, that's the interesting uh, research problem again. Yeah. Um, uh, let's let's talk about that more. Send me mail about it, okay? <laughs> yeah, sure, sir. Data. I will. Tell you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any other questions? Yes. There is a question I see in the chat box uh, okay. from uh, Mr. Puskar Kisot. What mm -hmm. are the possible types of attack on the intrusion detector in the SDN controller? Who can be the actors for performing the attack and how it can be mitigated? Okay, interesting question. I like it. Um, let's see. SDN controller, right? Okay. Um, okay. This is a, this is a very high level view, by the way. Um, so, what is the role of an SDN controller, first of all? I think maybe I should have gone back to the, uh, let me go back to the other slide, um, where you, you, you can see the actual role of SDN controller um, better way, right? You can see my slide, right? Okay. So, so the role of SDN controller is the following here, right? I, almost like, um, uh, 
the, the whole programmability. So if you see here, there is a northbound API, there is a southbound API. And the idea of the SDN controller is um, to be able to get the information of what's happening in the network and, and go and change uh, things uh, or program things, right? Now, so if you really look at it, the potential attacks I, I, I mentioned in one of my slides, like seven or eight different use cases um, where um, there may be configuration problem, people can get in through management interface, start changing, uh, try changing things. Obviously that has to be protected. An orchestration is uh, communicating with the SDN controller to go and make changes. Um, you need to secure this API, right? Then when controller is going and trying to make changes, um, so let's say the AC access control list, you are trying to configure a firewall saying uh, host IP address, uh, uh, the flow between IP1 or IP2 and port number this um, have to be stopped. And it, this guy goes and does something else, right? So the, the fudging attack, uh, protocol fudging attack, that could happen. And then uh, the other thing I was giving an example of overwhelming, so SDN controller, somebody can send lots of lots of requests or you get you got thousand firewalls to be, that's more like a denial of service attack on the SDN controller where is a fake request, we go and try to configure lots of lots of routers. Uh, you know, I, I didn't show the example of routers here, but um, that's another interesting uh, attack. So typically we have to, it comes down to API type attack, configuration attacks, right? Um, yes. And, and then I didn't talk about multiple controller. There is a, uh, there are hierarchy of controller, global controller, local controller, right? And that part I didn't show that here. This is, I'm focusing only one controller, by the way. Yes, next question. Yeah, another question uh, I see in the chat box. If we consider the lack in the data protection laws at India, what can be your suggestion to the government for making it sure that the data of, of citizens using 5G networks are safe to a certain threshold level? Okay, that's a um, little bit of regulatory question, right? Um, yeah. So, so important part is, again, it varies from country to country. Uh, so there is a, I mean, there is a need, sometimes they call it lawful intercept, right? Uh, and, you know, in 3GPP, then we started looking into it. To what extent government should have the ability to go and look into the data, um, the private privacy part, right? But uh, if I am doing intrusion detection, um, I should, to protect the network and protect my users, operators should have the ability um, to look at some of the metadata, right? You may not have complete information about the um, the SPI stuff, right? Which are the the private privacy stuff, right? So again, I, I think it is a it is important to have a trade-off between uh, security and privacy because uh, and that varies from country to country again. Any other questions? from participants. OK, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Datta for uh, giving a nice uh, lecture, very detailed lecture about the security in SDN, NFV and 5G networks. Uh, he uh, dealt with many issues starting from uh, the 5G network enablers, 5G adoption and uses. Question? Okay. Okay. Go ahead, please. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Maybe it's built. If, if you if you have a question you're not able to uh, communicate now please, please uh, send chat me mail. Box. Chat oh, box yeah. or you can send me mail also if, okay. you, if you're running out of time or anything. Yeah. Okay. okay let me continue. Uh, he gave an idea of the virtual security, predictive security using AI ML, cloud RAN security opportunities, challenges, and mitigation. Also to how to improve the resilience of network through the mobile ACE cloud security, local authentication, then network slicing security. Also, lastly, he dealt about the SDN controller, potential SDN controller attacks, virtualization and management. So 
uh, Professor Dutta detailly, de in detail discussed about the various issues, challenges, and mitigation techniques uh, in SDN, NFB, and 5G networks. It is uh, uh, very much, uh, it will be very much helpful for the uh, researchers in this working in this area such that he has opened up many research challenges and opportunities and particularly with IEEE, how the uh, people working in this area, maybe student or faculty or any independent worker who can uh, take uh, work in uh, with IEEE and also work in virtual labs, exploit the opportunities they are working. So we got a lot of information through his lecture. So thank you, Professor Datta. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Enlightening yeah. us about all this in short, okay. short span of time. Thank <laughs> you. Thank all. you, Professor Das. I know there are so many distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, please uh, attend those. Again, um, is, I feel like homecoming uh, because I, I graduated from NIT Rotkala in 1985. So um, I'll be happy to interact with anybody um, who, you know, is in NIT Rotkala or anywhere else in the world. As I typically volunteer, it's my duty. Um, to engage everybody and you know contribute and give the opportunity for all of you to enhance uh, your expertise and collaborate with uh, world class experts uh, within IEEE. Professor Das, uh, Professor Bakshi, yes. uh, thank you very much, and um, Professor De and um, uh, Professor Itisha Mishra and um, Director Professor Biswas, uh, thank and, and Professor Patra. Yeah. Thank you very much.